As you can see, today we're going to do a panel called Cosplaying the Law. It's basically an informative panel to just make sure that you're better aware of the sort of things you need to take into consideration while you're cosplaying, especially considering weapons, dress, uh, behaviour, that kind of stuff. It's not uh, teaching you to suck eggs, but it's just to give you some extra hints and information so you can be better able to uh, stay out of trouble, to be honest. <laughs> That's not what you're going to do. Any at the back of a police car explain to some bemused looking police officer why you're walking around the Sheffield City Centre carrying a samurai sword. <laughs> <laughs> Is that Sheffield? Sheffield? No, 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 that's Sheffield. Sheffield. That's, that's that in America, but I, when I typed in York. police and cosplay UK, I couldn't really be find anything appropriate. <laughs> okay, as an overview, I'm going to start off with an introduction, basically just telling you what I aim to do and uh, who I am. Uh, the aims of the panel itself, what I want to get across, uh, basically the various laws and legislation that I'm going to be going through. It's split into about three or four different parts. I've tried to make it as interesting as possible. Uh, get rid of any common, common myths and misconceptions. Basically, there's always people who say, well, if you carry stuff on XYZ ground, you'll be alright, or it doesn't matter if you keep it in a scabbard. Just little things like that, little things where people have convinced themselves that it's all right to do and it's not, and they'll only ever find out, you know, when the custody sergeant is asking how old you are, if there's anyone you want to contact. <laughs> and basically, just tips and tricks to avoid getting into trouble. And then, if any of you have any questions at the end, crack on. Okay, I'm Leadbill. I've been cosplaying for about five, six years. Uh, recently joined the police force. Uh, as you can see, this is what I like to think I do. And that's what I actually do. <laughs> have our wheels of steel on the end. Oh. <laughs> that's the aim of the panel. Basically, I want to provide you uh, with a piece of relevant legislation, stuff to keep in the back of your mind. Uh, what is likely to attract attention? You know, what, what do members of the public, members of the authorities look for when you're carrying stuff around? what's likely to uh, get them upset. Um, relevant laws, legislation, uh, get staying civil, and basically I want to try and keep this as fun and as informative as possible. I really don't want it to be a lecture. I'm not going to teach you to suck eggs. You're all intelligent people, but it's just stuff that you can... <laughs> it, it's a bit arrows for your quiver, basically, so you'd be better able to stay out of trouble. Laws and legislation. And, uh, yeah, I'll try not to make it too boring. Okay, uh, a term you're going to hear me use a few times during this panel is a public place. Um, basically, there's a legal definition for a public place, um, and it does exceed England's green and verdant fields. However, in law, it is defined as a public place includes any highway or any other premises or place to which, in material time, the public have or, uh, have or are permitted to have access to the payment or otherwise. Basically, pretty much anywhere the public can do, go to is a public area basically. So for example this convention centre uh, is a public place even though technically it's a university campus. S some pieces of legislation, for example trespass would class as private property, but for things like weapons legislation is counted as public property. So yes, the Excel Centre yeah. is a constant debate on whether it's private ground or public ground. With regards to weapons legislation, it is public property. I know that uh, for local bylaws and stuff, for XL security, it is still owned by the XL Centre, and for some legislation, it's private. But for the ones we're going to be talking to today, it's going to be public property, because the public have access to it through payment or otherwise. It's also a thoroughfare, if you notice, for people going up over the land bridge and everything. Uh, basically, what does it mean to the community? Basically, various places that conventions are meant to take place, they're all pretty much, by definition, public property. There are a few exceptions. Uh, meetings at houses, uh, private buildings where the public don't normally have access, um, good most scout hats, that kind of stuff, where the public will normally not be permitted unless through invitation. Uh, but a lot of these big, big public places, they count under the legislation. Right, number one, <laughs> offensive weapons. As you can see there, someone's rocking a baseball bat right there. The legislation. Any person who has a lawful authority, reasonable excuse, has him or her in any public place, any offensive weapon, made, intended, adapted, shall be guilty of an offence. 
Sounds a bit complex, but I'm going to break that down for you. Offensive weapon. There are three different types of offensive weapons you need to keep in mind. Made, adapted, and intended. Now, your made offensive weapons are your things like your axes, your batons, your martial arts equipment. They're made to cause injury. That is their primary function. Then you've got adapted. So it's something, something normally maybe quite innocuous that's been made into an offensive weapon. So a broken bottle, uh, a piece of wood with a nail in the end. It's been made to become something that will cause harm. And then you've got intended. And basically anything can be intended. As long as the intent can be proved that you're going to use it to hurt somebody. So this laptop. If I climb up there now and say, I'm going to kill you with this laptop, it becomes an intended offensive weapon because that's what I intend to do so. There are exemptions for having offensive weapons. Uh, things like soldiers, police officers, you see police officers that carry things like batons, they have a legal exemption. Cosplayers, you find that a lot of uh, more shown in anime as martial arts equipment, ninja equipment, bokken, tonfa, uh, that kind of thing. Keep in mind that when you carry them around, should you find a particularly awkward security guard or police officer, they might get a bit funny with you carrying this thing around. It is technically an offensive weapon. Whether they could prove that you intended to use it for anything other than just cosplay is a bit more difficult to prove, but it's something to consider because technically under law, unless it's an offensive weapon and you do need a lawful excuse to have it. Now, whether it went as far as a charging decision, once you got arrested, to say, because they might consider cosplay as a lawful excuse, but what you don't want is you don't want to have to go through all that. You want to just avoid the trouble completely because you may well be found innocent after five, six hours in a cell and then you speak to your solicitor, but you, don't want, you want to avoid all that in the first place. It's not really something, if you can avoid it, it's best, it's best to do so. Right, second we have pointed and bladed weapons. Basically, you've got your swords, your axes, your throwing stars, anything, screwdrivers, anything with a point or a blade. There are a bit of Attack on Titan, current flavour of the month. And Mr. Anderson rocking his own pointed and bladed articles. This is the legislation. Any person who has an article with either bladed or sharply pointed or bladed, sharply pointed offensive weapon in a public place, school premises, without lawful authority or good reason, shall be guilty of an offence. Well, you've got there some examples of pointed and bladed articles. So you've got your swords, you've got your axes, you've got your spears, you've got your throwing stars, as I, as I mentioned before. Now these tend to crop up quite a lot, especially in cosplay, because uh, a lot of the characters tend to carry edged weapons. Uh, you've got things like Bleach, Naruto, many others. Um, and they're quite popular. It's best, as a piece of advice, to avoid proper weapons. That's all I can say. I mean, there are plenty of third-party manufacturers that will make them out of wood, latex, foam. It's just, there's no point in having a proper sword. I know it probably looks great in photos, but get a wooden one and five minutes in Photoshop and it'll look just as good. Because this is what the sort of thing you'd be looking at if you go out and buy a real one and then take it to a convention. Because all it takes is one member of the public to get the wrong end of the stick. And next thing you know, you're in a world of trouble. You're having to explain it to your mum over the phone in custody crying. <laughs> which we don't want. The exemptions to pointed blade articles are folding knives. Basically, if the blade is under three inches and it folds. Uh, and, uh, lock knives are forbidden, technically, well, the term technically counts as pointed bladed weapons. Um, Swiss Army knives, if the blade is over three inches, they tend to get a bit funny because a lot of them are locked. However, there are exemptions available. Lawful excuse. Uh, do you have a good reason to be carrying it? So, for example, if you... Uh, work in construction uh, and you have a standing knife on you and you've proved that, that you're on your way to work, that will be a lawful excuse. I um, was dealing with a chap in custody the other day. Um, he'd been arrested for drunk and disorderly. Uh, he gets we take him to custody. During the search of his bag, a standing knife was found. Uh, my colleague had then arrested him for having a pointed and bladed article in his possession. It wasn't until we came to the interview, and I was chatting to the gentleman, and he told me that he does, he does in fact work in construction, and he'd gone straight from work out. So he hadn't had an opportunity to take his work equipment home. 
So therefore, after we did some further investigation, his bag had things like a uh, high-vis helmet, things to tie in with his story. That charge was eventually no further action because he had a lawful excuse to have it in his possession. Now, it, as I said there, it's within reason. So for, if, um, if you worked in construction and you went home and changed into your nice going out clothes and still had your starting knife on you and you were found with it after you were arrested, no longer a lawful excuse. You had the opportunity to get rid of it. Why have you got a starting knife blade on you? It isn't a stop port. You don't need one taped to your shoe. <laughs> and basically, what's it mean to cosplayers? So you've got things like swords, martial arts equipment, arrows. The best advice I can give you is, I mean, there's people who do amazing stuff with other materials. Just don't take the risk. You know, I've seen fantastic stuff with wood, metal, latex, carbon fiber. It's not worth it. It's just, and the lighter as well, you'll find as well. And it's just, it removes that extra layer of worry because you won't be looking over your shoulder every five minutes thinking, is, you know, am I being followed? Am I going to get in trouble? It's, you know, and the lighter as well. I mean, this for example, I, um, a friend of mine made this. From a distance, it looks fairly real, but it's just made of wood. And, uh, you know, I, as far as I'm concerned, in photos, it looks just the part. I mean, I've seen, you can buy these made out of latex as well. Uh, there's a really good one, they do in like LARP shops and stuff. It's 80 quid though, so I wasn't quite tempted to drop that amount of money on what is essentially just an axe. Uh, you've got this as well. Looks nice and real, but in fact it's made from carbon fibre. It's, uh, as you can see, it looks the real deal from here. I mean, if I was to run it, you would want to it, you'd probably flinch. But when you get up to it, it's just... Tarmus. It's just... It's, it's much easier, basically, to just use lighter, easier materials. Right, replica imitation firearms. This uh, comes up quite a lot in cosplay. It's quite a contentious issue, and it's on the rise. As you can see, our, our friend uh, Alucard there modelling one for us, although I don't think that's a replica somehow. <laughs> right, the primary piece of legislation regarding replica imitation firearms is the Violent Crime Reduction Act 2006. Uh, basically, a piece of legislation brought in a few years ago now to deal with um, the use of replica and actual firearms in violent crime uh, because there had been a spike uh, of their use in things like robberies, uh, assaults, uh, extortion, that kind of thing. And the government rushed through a piece of legislation. As you can see there. A uh, yeah, brief uh, overview of what is a realistic imitation firearm. It's, uh, it, basically, it's something that looks like a gun. So, this is an imitation firearm. Because, for all intents and purposes, it looks like a real one. It's the correct size, it's the correct shape, and from a distance, unless you came up and had a close look at it, most people would assume this is real. Obviously, in this current context, we're in a cosplay context, so you, you probably realise it's not real, but if Joe Public was to walk in now, from this distance, it would look real. Got another example here, got a pistol. I mean, this is only plastic, but from the paint job, it, looks, it basically looks like polished metal. Under the VCRA, there are several exemptions that were provided. Uh, some of them had to be fought for by the relevant interested parties. It got quite messy, and it wasn't until about 2007 that some of these were ironed out. But I remember, because I was airsofting at the time, they were fighting tooth or nail, because it looked like airsoft was going to be banned. But they fortunately managed to dig their heels in, and they were able to basically get an exemption. But a few other organisations have exemptions as well. Crown servants. So, we're looking at your armed forces, your police, fire service, that kind of thing. They have an exemption for training purposes. Obviously the police train with uh, replica imitation firearms to make the scenarios more realistic. The armed forces do as well. Uh, they also use it for drill. Historical reenactors. You know when you go to some uh, country fate and you know, you've got people reenacting uh, various battles from history. You've got your World War II weekends. Um, at the steam galas and that sort of thing. This covers that. You have to be able to prove that you're a reenactor, normally part of a reenacting guild or a group, um, and that will then give you the ability to buy 
or at least have these um, guns purchased. It's still a bit of form filling in to do, but they got their exemption that they wanted. TV and film productions, I still work in TV and film occasionally. Um, these days, um, I remember the time when I first started out, people were encouraged to bring their own because it kept production costs down. Now, due to um, a lot of very silly things going on, um, it's now primarily done by armourers with specialist licences. When I was working on Skyfall uh, a couple of years ago, we were stood on Whitehall, um, all dressed as armed police, ironically enough, and um, we had a talk from the chap from the Metropolitan Police Film Unit. He said, while you dress like this, make sure you behave very responsibly because the way you dress, people are going to assume that you're police officers, so just behave yourselves. He said, don't go off the site. We then had a further briefing from the assistant director. He said, don't go off the site. What did some silly plank go and do? About halfway through, in to break one of the scenes, he went off, rifle strapped to his chest, went off to Costa Coffee down the street. <laughs> Next thing we know, a load of motorcycles pull up on blues, and this guy is being escorted by real police, you know, into a back of a van. And basically, the director had an aneurysm. It was not the finest hour. And it, it, it's basically, this is one of the reasons now that you'll find that for TV productions is primarily controlled by armourers rather than private individuals. Airsoft. Airsoft is an exemption under the VCRA. Um, to get the airsoft exemption, you need to have a site membership from one of the various sites around the country. To get a site membership, you need to play three games in no less than two months. So you can't just nail them all out three weeks running. You need to show that you're a consistent person, uh, a consistent attendee. This is a particular thing I'd like to draw your attention to. The amount of times I hear people going on about, you have to join UCARA. UCARA is uh, the United Kingdom Airsoft Retailers Association. As far as I'm concerned, it's a self-interested cabal of airsoft retailers. They put it out that you have to be part of this organization in order to get the VCRA exemption. That is not the case. The site membership route, which I've gone through, is perfectly right. They just All they want to do is boost their membership numbers because then you'll be more inclined to purchase weapons from their particular interested retailers. Now, I really don't like the way that they, it's been dominated now. Whenever you go on an airsoft forum, uh, cosplay forum, people are like, oh, how can I get XYZ? Right, you must join Yukara. No, you don't. Just go along to your local site, play a couple of games, three games in no less than two months, and you'll be able to get your exemption. You'll normally get uh, your name added to a database, which then when you purchase a gun from a retailer, they will then ring the, uh, the site and say, is XYZ a member? And they'll go, yes, and they'll ship the weapon out to you. Museums and galleries, obviously, to display weapons, they'll need permits to buy them. Uh, I went to the Imperial War Museum the other day. I'm sure all of you have been to various things that are very similar. Absolutely fantastic. It would look a bit bare if they didn't have the exemption to buy these weapons. Theatrical performances, you know, you've got your Les Miserables, uh, this Saigon. Well, I've actually seen this guy, I'm assuming a film about the Vietnam War, I have But yeah, that kind of thing as well. And uh, replica rotation firearms, if it's undersized, oversized, or at least 50% of its body is painted in a bright colour, it's no longer classed as a replica imitation firearm. That's why you see now, especially at Expo, you see them still selling replicas, or replica guns, but they're, because they're over 50% bright colours, you're allowed to just buy them off the store. That's why you can't, they're not all the correct colour because it would be breaking the law. It still doesn't stop people doing silly things with it, you know. Right, bit of a bit of pop quiz. Would you say this counts as a replica imitation firearm? Yes. Raise your hand if you think it is. Correct. Chap on the left, would you say that is a replica imitation firearm? Raise your hand if you think it is. Wrong. Because it's, it's not a representation of a real firearm. It's, just, it's basically a fake weapon. It, it, because it doesn't look like a firearm uh, or any normal use firearm, therefore it's not counted as an RIF under the VCRA legislation. Chap on the right, would you say that counts as a replica imitation firearm? Raise your hand if you think it is. Correct. 
Right, basically, it's a bit more of what it means to you. Um, basically, unless you have an exemption, you can't buy, trade, manufacture, or sell an REA. Um, and this basically includes spray painting. I am sick to death of seeing on cosplay forums people saying, oh, I bought such and such, but it was clear, so I sprayed it. If you're going to do it, don't advertise it. It's like boasting that you've just broken into your neighbour's car with a brick. It's just, it's essentially the same, you're still breaking, you're breaking the law. If you're going to do it, then don't advertise it. It's common sense. Uh, you must be over 18 to purchase an RAF. Um, yeah, VCRA also doesn't give you a carte blanche to carry an RAF in public. It doesn't mean that you can, you know, expo, you can walk around pretending that you're Andy McNabb and Bravo 2 Zero. It's all the colours is the buying, selling, trading, and manufacturing. It's not a magical carte blanche. You can't, it doesn't mean you can do anything you want with it. The regular rules still apply. You can't go, well, I, I've got VCRA exemption, I can, you know, wave it around my head outside the front of Expo when I stand on top of that big metal statue. It's not how it works. Uh, yeah, if you've got an exemption your friend has it, doesn't mean you can buy a gun for them. Or, if, as I said again, if you're going to do it, don't advertise it, because eventually someone will clock on, you know, you know what, you've seen the stuff in the news with like Prism and all that sort of stuff. Someone's going to be watching something somewhere. So, if you're going to do it, don't advertise it. You, don't, you, know, you don't know who's watching or who's listening. Basically, you've got to be careful with RAFs as well. Every time someone does something stupid, events crack down. We're eventually all we're going to be allowed is like small foam sticks or something. You know, every time someone does something silly, it ruins it for everyone else. So my best advice is just be careful, be considerate. Um, yeah, just use common sense. I mean, for example, you know, I don't wander around the event with this strapped across my back. I keep it in my, in my bag, and when I get it out for photos, so as you say, uh, and then I put it back in when it's not needed. I mean, I know people want to pose and look good and everything, but there's a time and a place. Get your photos, put it back in the bag, then someone has to get out again. It's not, it's not difficult. I mean, you're going to end up getting in trouble if you just carry it around all the time. Because, for example, you see that there's a main road that comes through here. Now, we all know there's a con on. The staff know there's a con on. The site security knows there's a con on. But, you know, Granny Miggins or whatever is driving through in a Citroen AX. She's driving along and she suddenly sees some guy with a gun strapped to his chest. She's not going to know what's going on. She might get the wrong idea, and next thing you know, the police get called. So, you've got to try and think about, we understand the context, but you've got to imagine what it looks like to someone who's possibly just passing through. So you've just got to be careful. Otherwise, you know, next thing you know, there's a helicopter above and someone's pointing a gun at you, a real one. <laughs> right, just a bit of advice about the cosplay dress. Right, as I said, I'm not going to teach you to suck eggs. You've probably all been doing this for a while. You know, you're all, you're all intelligent individuals. First thing I can say is just use common sense. If you suspect it's going to be offensive or inappropriate, tone it down or consider the context. I'm not, I'm, you know, I'm not the thought police. I can't tell you what to do. Um, I'm just saying, if you think there's a likelihood that someone might be legitimately offended, or you think that you might be get you in trouble, then reconsider. You see, there is no law against freedom of expression, body confidence, or bad taste. Everyone loves a bit of bad taste. However, if you believe if uh, something will be a visual representation, in this case a costume, that might cause threatening, abusive, or alarming behaviour to a member of the public, tentatively, it could come under Section 5 of the Public Order Act, uh, which is basically... Um, it's uh, the lowest down of the Public Order Act. It will uh, be difficult to make it stick, but what will most likely happen is if someone feels suitably offended, they'll probably ring the police or something. You go to, they'd, you'd end up getting arrested, you go to custody, and then it would get thrown out. But who needs that three hours of your life wasted? You know, so, for example, Nazi swastikas. I know that everyone wants their cat boy Schrodinger to be 100% accurate, but consider where you are. People still find it quite emotive, people still find it quite offensive. Consider it substituting for something else. Pornographic imagery, don't really see that too much, but occasionally you get someone pushing the boundaries of bad taste. I don't have a problem with it, like, for example, Kit Card, you know, it's a proper, it's over 18, so, you know, when you're at the hentai panel at stupid o'clock in the morning, it's fine. 
Just don't wander around outside your local primary school at 7 a.m. in the morning. <laughs> <laughs> Miniature style costumes, uh, primarily context based. You need to be considerate of where you are and also what is going on in the world around you. A good example would have been um, May Expo. It was just after the soldier was killed in South London. Uh, the police were on high alert and they were paying particularly closer attention to those who were wearing more militaristic dress. Um, it's something to consider. You know, you'd be drawing unnecessary attention to yourself because obviously if the public are on tenterhooks anyway, you're just going to make him a bit more funny and paranoid. Overtly sexual and revealing costumes. As I said again, you know, there's no law against freedom of expression, body confidence, but remember that if it's too OTT, you're getting into legal territory. And someone, you know, someone with a slightly more um, sensitive sensibilities uh, might be more easily offended than we would be. And you know, it's as I said. You know, we're all intelligent people, we know what we're doing, but you've got to consider, you know, Joe Public, who has no idea what's going on and has been living in a basement for the last five years. You know, they come out and they're like, oh my God, what's this? And the first thing they do is they reach for the phone. And I should know this, because this happens a lot. The amount of bone calls I get at work is ridiculous. Right, public and private. Basically, what you can wear in private, you can knock, your, knock yourself out. Uh, public, you've got to be a bit more considerate. Also, be careful of public and private. If the public can see into where you are, it can sometimes still pass as public and law. So, there's something to bear in mind. Uh, and as I said before, consider current uh, context and location, uh, military style costumes, you're in heightened terror levels, that kind of stuff. Glumping, just no. <laughs> I find it incredibly irritating. Um, a lot of people do. If you if you do insist on glomping, ask permission first. Because technically, running up to someone and dive-hugging them... Let, if, let me put it this way, if you were on the tube and someone did it, you'd probably call the police, wouldn't you? So just because you're in a costume doesn't necessarily mean it's any different. Because especially if you spent loads of time and money on it. So if, you, if you're going to do it, or someone you look like they're going to do it, tell them in advance. Because as far as I'm concerned, I fucking hate it, to be honest. It just irritates the hell out of me. I normally see him coming and trying to trip them up. <laughs> location, location, location. This just refers to where uh, you might want to have photo shoots, meets, that kind of place. The camera is quite relevant. Always keep in mind where you are uh, with regards to location. You never know who's watching. You never know. Um, you never know the basics about the area unless you ask. Normally, what I do is I scout it out beforehand. Just get an idea. Last thing we want to do is turn up with a load of stuff, be dripping with weaponry, and you know, there's endless dog walks walking through going, what's going on here then? Next thing I know, I hear sirens in the distance. Uh, does the event have exclusive use of the venue? So, how likely is the place that you're cosplaying at going to be sharing? Excel Center is a really good example of this. How many times have you been to Expo and there's something else going on? I mean, there's a whole multitude Next of various events model. I've seen. You know, whether it's uh, the, that Nigerian faith uh, meeting, or the peace convention, or there was that boxing, that mixed martial arts convention. You don't know what else is going to be going on. So you don't know, because you won't have exclusive use of it, just be considerate that there will be non-cosplayers there that may not be aware of the context. Are there any ven venue rules or local bylaws to consider? Excel Centre is a good example. Uh, obviously, Excel have their own idea about weapon rules, as you've seen, they're quite draconian in May. Um, Expo had one set of rules, Excel had another, the two sort of fight, you know, it was ridiculous, they were just going, there was lots of contradictions, a lot of people raging on the forums, well, one person told me this was alright, one person told me it wasn't. It's something to consider. Local bylaws as well, uh, this applies basically like public transport infrastructure as well. Um, what might technically be okay in the street may not be like the station, that kind of stuff. Uh, or in your local park, parks have bylaws as well. So when you're having a cosplay meet in a park, is there, is there something to consider like, as they say, well, no meetings of over 20 individuals or, you know, certain dress must be worn. It's just something to keep in mind. Very rarely do these things get enforced and you most likely will be all right, but it's something to keep in mind just as an extra sort of safety level. Yeah, that's another one. Where's your photo shoot location? Is it next to the M1? You know, is it next to a railway line? When you're in the 
you're in a field somewhere brandishing all kind of weaponry when the 813 from Chepstow comes past and all the passengers are pressed up against the windows wondering what the hell's going on. It's just something to keep in mind. So what I tend to do is when I have photo shoots and stuff somewhere, I like to go to almost secluded where there's little chance of someone bumbling through the middle of it. And then either they get panicked or I have to spend the next five minutes explaining to them why I'm dressed the way I am, carrying what I am, and hoping that they're not going to go freak out and like set their Labrador on or something. So obviously this applies to photographers especially, uh, obtaining permission to have photos in places. Uh, this goes to like, you know, when people like to go to old abandoned warehouses, um, derelict buildings, certain locations. If possible, ask permission first. Uh, trespass is a civil offence, so chances are you're not going to get arrested for it, but someone might serve you a summons, or at the very least an angry security guard is going to chase you off the site while you're half-dressed. <laughs> it's just, if you find somewhere, best off ringing the site owner and saying, can I use your derelict asbestos filled building for shooting on XYZ day. Nine times out of ten they'll say yes unless there's any present safety hazards. It doesn't hurt to ask and it'll save you a load of trouble. Are weapons allowed? As I said, it varies from con to con, event to event. Uh, some are more strict than others. Um, best to check on the forums or the website beforehand because otherwise you're going to turn up with all your you know, weapons you spent absolutely ages making, you know, beautiful works of art and then some beardy tosser will say, no, you can't use that, and you have to put it in a bin liner and take it back to your room. It's just something to consider. I mean, I don't think there are any no-weapon cons that I've been to in the UK. I think some of the smaller ones get a bit funny about it. Uh, some of the one-day ones you find in like shopping centres and stuff. Do the Waterstones events allow weapons? Has anyone been to one? Uh, I think so. I think with props. Yeah, yeah. Well, okay. But it's just something the to consider. Really it's all best like to check, just props. in case. Windows or CCTV, something else to consider. You know, you may not be able to see anyone um, while you're doing what you're doing, but be aware of CCTV. CCTV is a big one because whoever sat, some guy could be sat in an office 15 miles away, no idea of the context of what is going on. You know there's a convention, the photographer knows there's a convention, the 10 people watching you know there's a convention. But you know, Joe Blogg sat in a CCTV control room 10 miles away, he doesn't. And all he's gonna see is someone with a sword waving over their head and you know, he's gonna press the big red button. And it's happened, I had a friend who um, uh, was with another friend at a DLR station uh, outside of Expo, and she was showing sword to another friend, and next thing you know, police run onto the platform and felt to spray in the face with gas. Because some CCTV operator had gone, what the hell? And just pressed the big red button. And because he had no idea of the context of going out. The, wood is, uh, the sword isn't turned out with wood, but obviously on grainy black and white CCTV, you can't tell, and you know, You've also got to take into account the intelligence of the person standing at the <laughs> Tips and tricks. There's quite a few here. Uh, if you're going to carry IRFs, don't use a gun bag. I know it sounds funny, why would you not carry a gun in a gun bag? But it's for precisely that reason. What goes in gun bags? Gun. Guns. So anyone who knows what they're looking for will know what's in the bag. So members of the public, uh, police officers, if they see something that looks like a gun bag, they will assume that there is a gun in it. And you will, might get you into trouble, it, or at the very least, it's going to get you a stop and account. Someone will come over and say, what are you doing? And next thing you know, you've got a little pink form to take, time with, take home with you. It's just an extra 20, 30 minutes out of your day that is best avoided. My best piece of advice is, if you can disassemble it, disassemble it, and carry it in a hold all or something. That's what I do. Um, for, for long arms, I mean, I've got this bag here, and it is a gun bag, but what I do is, before transporting it, is I wrap it up in a couple of loads of bin bags, tape it all up so it just looks like nothing in particular. And I just carry that. As far as people are concerned, it looks like I'm carrying a piece of wood wrapped in a bin liner. But then again, you get all sorts of weirdness on the tube, so no one ever gives me a funny look. <laughs> Don't unpack your weapons and IFs in car parks or places where the public frequents. I have heard dozens of stories are people who have been ended up being arrested or at least in trouble because they've been showing their mate their best weapon, you know, their best new gun or something in the car park of Tesco's. Uh, a friend of mine the other week, uh, his mate um, got arrested because they were doing, uh, he was selling an airsoft gun from one chap to the other. He didn't want to pay for postage, so they went to the Tesco, money changed hands, and basically they parked the cars up and transferred it from one room to the other. You know, some last with a shopping trolley saw it, rang it in, 
you know, I've just seen a gun exchange in the car park at Tesco's. As you can imagine, pandemonium. You know, Nazis riding dinosaurs, you know, <laughs> fire from the heavens. Next thing you know, it's all sorts of trouble. If you can avoid it, just don't do it. I mean, there's easier ways. Yeah, if you can, um, disassemble your prop or design them so they can be taken apart. And not only does this mean that you won't look like you're carrying a bin liner wrapped stave on the train, uh, it will also mean it's better protected against knocks, scrapes and stuff. Um, it's easily, more easily transported. It's a practical thing as, as well. I mean, I find that I, it's much easier to carry something you know, that's about that size and that size. Uh, further to my last point, if you do happen to be stopped by police, be polite, be honest, and be upfront about what you've got. Because as soon as you lie, they're going to think you've got something to hide. So if you're carrying a gun bag, and an officer comes up and goes, what's in your gun bag? Just say, I have a replica firearm, I have a replica sword, whatever. Don't lie and say nothing, because should they then go on to search you and they find said item, they'll assume that you have something to hide. It may not result in you being arrested, but it just means more time out of your day. And the other, you know, while he rings up and finds out, like, is such and such about, it's just time out of your day. Especially if you're heading to an event or you've got a train to catch. It's just avoid that little bit of pain in the ass. So just be upfront, be polite, be honest, and normally nine times out of ten, unless you carry something you really, really shouldn't be, a simple explanation will be enough to get on your way. I mean, I stopped a chat the other day with him what like a samurai sword strapped to the side of his back. Took him to one side, and I, I was like, fella, what's that? And it turns out it was um, one of these umbrellas with a big, long samurai sword handle. I was like, you need to be a bit more careful, mate. You can't really carry that on the tube. Because someone with a more jittery disposition is going to freak out and say there's a sword-wielding nut on the tube or something. So I said, you know, if you can, mate, just stick it in your bag itself instead of strapping it to the side. And he was fine with it. Now, another officer might have been more obtuse, or it might have taken longer, or he might have interpreted the rules differently. So instead of risking losing that time out of your day, just be careful. With, regard, with regards to being stopped by the police, nine times out of ten, it'll be what we call a stop at a cap, which is under section 61. Basically, the police will just ask you what you're doing, the reason they, they, they're having a word with you and what you're up to. And what they'll do is they'll give you a form to that effect. Searches, despite what you see on TV, searches very rarely take place. It's only when a police officer believes that you have something on you you shouldn't do. Now, as you can see, you've got Section 47 of the Firearms Act. Uh, so if I saw you dressed in military gear with a what was like a gun bag on the tube, I might be inclined to search under Section 47. Uh, if I suspected you had a badger or part of a badger on your person, I could search under the Badgers Act. Uh, basically, but you have to be, have reasonable grounds to believe. It, they can't just do it willy-nilly. But don't give them those grounds. Don't make yourself look suspicious, because it's just time out of your day. I know that you're not all you know, drug-carrying arms smugglers, but um, eventually it's just a case of not being having that time taken out. It's just no point. Further to my, uh, what I said earlier, if you're going to do something you shouldn't do, don't advertise it in public forums online because you don't know who's watching. This is a big one. The amount of times people go around painting airsoft guns. It just don't, if you're going to do it, just don't talk about it. It's just a big no-no. Um, there was a thing on a forum I was on a few months ago about some guy was saying he was going to carry a, he thought it would be alright to carry a gun through airport security. Yeah. <laughs> and I, I, Basically, once I've finished eating my fist, and trying to get uh, trying to get across that it's just not going to go well. It's like, oh, they won't notice. I'm like, they fucking will notice. But they can notice a 500 ml bottle of water in my bag. They're going to notice exactly. a gun. It yeah. took some convincing to realise that the only thing that will happen in transporting a gun through airport security is that he's going to be on the 10 o'clock news. <laughs> they won't even let me put a safety pin badge on yeah, my bag. They were really why he thought he'd be able to get away with that? Oh, I'm only travelling from Ireland to England. Yeah, that's not going to cause any problems. <laughs> <laughs> At that point, I had an aneurysm and passed out. Of <laughs> Beware of CCTV. As I said earlier, an operator in a patrol room 30 miles away may not be aware of the context of the convention or the event. 
all he sees is someone waving a gun on his CCTV camera. And it's probably the most exciting thing that's happened to him all week. Because he's there, you know, he's finishing his pot noodle, and he's got seven hours of his shift left, and suddenly excitement. And he, may, may, he or she may be well prone to overreact. Worst case scenario, you know, you've got your prop gun or something, and you, someone has seen it, and the armed police have been called. Most important, do everything that they say. The quicker you comply with their instructions, the quicker everything can be sorted out. You must not make any sudden movements, because if, they have re if they've deployed armed police, they have reason to believe that you have something on you that you really, really shouldn't, and it's considered a threat to the public. They will be pointing real guns at you, and as far as I, just don't make any sudden movements, follow their instructions. Once, once they, it's all sorted, they will be able to iron out whatever. They, they are all firearms experts, they are all weapon experts, so they'll be able to tell very quickly that your you know, prop is just a prop. And nine times out of ten, you'll be allowed to go on your way. But if you go, why should I fucking do this? You can't tell me what to do. Or try and do something stupid like run or put your hands in your jacket. It, I'm not saying you're going to get shot, but you're going to make them a lot more touchy. It's going to take longer. Just the best advice I can give you is if, you, if it's gone far enough to get to that stage, just comply with the instructions and it'll be over as soon as possible. If you drag it out, you're going to end up spending the next six hours in a cell with taser burns. <laughs> also, don't necessarily worry about accuracy. If your gun is inaccurate and you're worried about it, don't be. I mean, you've seen what Photoshop can do these days. You can Photoshop anything to anything. So who cares if your gun is half orange? All it's going to take is when you get your photos done at a con or a convention or whatever, just go on Photoshop afterwards and no one will be able to tell the difference. No one's going to think any less of you of walking around with a gun with 50% like bright orange. Everyone knows what the rules are. You know, everyone knows that's why they are. And it's not worth taking the risk, especially if you're going to go to a very public event, so expos for example. I mean, I'm still not a big advocate of that sort of walking around like patrolling stuff that seems to be going on at the moment. I mean, don't get me wrong, some people like to feel that, you know, they're ultimate warrior, or not ultimate warrior, Robocop or whatever. That's fine, but it's just a risk. And it's like, do you really want to take that risk? And finally, don't be tempted to use real swords and weapons for cosplay. As I said before, use replicas, wood, latex, foam. They all look the, the right part. The only reason you want a real sword is to do well, to stick it up on your wall or something. There's no reason to have one for cosplay. There's no valid reason. Uh, keep it in your own home or a controlled environment, like a meet that is actually private, not for something like this. I said, don't know this for you. Next thing you know, you get an early 6 a.m. wake up call from CO19 um, and someone's tasering you because you scratched your chin at the wrong time. Right. Any questions? <laughs> <laughs> yes? What about things like, I know you showed the GIF of Attack on Titan earlier, but um, I don't know if you know it, but they shoot the, um, these hooks out of um, their gear um, to latch onto the buildings yeah. and stuff. So, like, the hooks on the end of it would assume would be metal. Obviously, no one would be stupid enough to make it out of metal. But, like, Never seen what it would be the best way to, to do something like that? If you want to make it so it could actually not fire necessarily, but be extended to photos. I would say make it out of the most, in, uh, I would say make it out, initially make it out of soft or a, a safe material and then go from there. If, it, if you do still want it to project or fire, providing that it's not over a certain amount of, um, I think it's one joule of energy, it won't count as an air weapon. It's, as long as it's safe and it's tethered, um, you should normally be alright. Um, Zeriel once did a, a prop workshop where he did get a real hook yeah. and you made a mould of it and you used the rubber or the latex. So you can make it look exactly like it, oh, but it's made out of rubber. So basically as long as it didn't forcibly extend, it would be fine. You just have to extend it for photos. As in yeah, like the ideally it's it, it. stuff like that is very difficult to judge, especially when you're using pneumatics and that sort of stuff. It would be much easier to use photo manipulation and stuff. Unless you would reach a level where you were confident that you could guarantee how long it would extend, uh, you were using it in a controlled environment. You, I mean, I've seen people use cosplay where they've done things with fire and they've got extending blades and stuff. 
that's good, providing safe materials are used, or if they're <coughs> real, so you're using metal, or you're using pyrotechnics and stuff. In, in, in private photo shoots, or at home, that's fine. In public, yeah. you've started to get into dodgy legal yeah. territory. Okay. Anyone else? Reference when you were talking about pointed weapons. Yeah. Is that just respective to blades that are made out of metal, such as like aluminium or steel? What happens if it was some kind of like a plastic shard that was pretty sort of rigid? No tension plastic, would that still count as a blade? Weapon? No, it normally has to be metal, uh, or it, at the very least, uh, <coughs> solid and sharp enough to cause injury. Normally, carbon fibre uh, plastic will not count as a pointed or bladed at all. Nine times out of ten, you'll find that it has to be metal because that is what's capable of causing injury. Things like plastic carbon fiber, you know, all you've got to do is hit the blade to the side of something like that and shatter. And it, it doesn't necessarily have the rigidity to cause serious injury. Um, it might, if you were going to use a plastic blade to injure someone, it might then come under as an intended offensive weapon. But initially, under legislation, it probably wouldn't count as that. What about wooden sword? Wooden swords, they, Things like uh, intended wooden swords, like things like Bokken, they are offensive weapons um, because they are intended to be this uh, that shape. They're not pointed and bladed because they don't have a point or a blade, but they are counted as offensive weapons. Same with Tomfers. Um, you need to be very careful with <coughs> that kind of thing. Nine times out of ten, if I was going to have a cosplay that required a Bokken or something similar, I would make a replica out of something much lighter. Because, you know, Bokken is a big heavy thing made out of oak and I could stove your skull in with it. Whereas, I'd be trying pretty hard to do it if I made out of pine. I mean, you'd have to go in for about 10 minutes before I got some results. Martial arts equipment though, does count quite, quite a that. How do some of the laws apply in Scotland? Because I know Scottish and English laws are completely different. Well, I'm going to put my cards on the table here. No idea. Um, <laughs> I've, I've got a couple of friends who work as Scottish officers and there's some significant differences legally. Um, and. I couldn't tell you to be honest. Um, there's so much has changed in recent years between the legislation between uh, England and Wales and Scotland. I couldn't tell you. I do apologise. Anyone else? Sorry, it's not related to cosplay, but I um, have a box cutter for work. Is that one of the things that I, because I often forget to put it in my locker, um, so I put it in my bag quite a lot of times. So it's not, it's, you can lock the blade up. But you I would have a lawful excuse for doing so. If you were taking it to or from work and you well, said... Well, I forget about it quite a lot, so it ends up in the bottom of my bag. Well, if it's at the bottom of your bag, you, if you can prove you work at a place that requires yeah. a box cutter, and you know it's either to or from work, you normally will be all right. You might get asked a couple of extra questions by the officer with you, yeah. but normally you wouldn't have a problem because that's a lawful excuse. Yeah. For, as I said before, if you um, carry a cable stripper or a standing knife and you've left it in your bag, um, or you know, you're in a job where you, you require something like that, you normally will be all right if you're heading to or from work. Uh, you, you know, you've, got, you've just left it in there. Like that chap I was explaining to you the other day that you know, he'd left his uh, life stripper thingy in his bag, and then he went out on the piss and got arrested for D&D, &D. and then during the search he was like, what's this? But he was then able to provide a valid excuse, and he had evidence to back that up. However, if you've gone home, Changed, gone out again in your nice smart stuff, yeah, and no, you're still in your pocket. And I tend to take the same bag with me. You probably need to answer a few more questions, but you, if, as a, if it was in a bag would, rather than on your person, it might be different. Yeah, if it was in your bag, you might, yeah. you'd probably be alright. If it was on your person or you had it oh, in no, inside okay. pocket, yeah. then you'd be different. Alright, thanks. Anyone else? Oh, quick one. What's the hug I give for? <laughs> My eyes are mesmerised by it. <laughs> it's uh, from Cromarty High School. Uh. Um, I was looking for funny gifts, and uh, that one came up, and uh, I decided I liked it. <laughs> <laughs> Who doesn't like Freddy looking at Ollie Pop? He judges all of the sins. Thanks, everyone. Anything else? Okay, well, thank you for coming. I really appreciate it. it was, uh, I'm glad you all managed to sit through. Uh, my incredibly boring lecture. I do, uh, do appreciate you all coming and I hope you found it useful. Thank you very much. <laughs>